Chapter 23, verse one. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And what he's saying is, they were never given that authority, but they sit in that seat now. And they sit in that seat, rightly dividing supposedly the word of truth. And there's over 6,000 Pharisees in the land at this moment. And Jesus says, these scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries. These are the things that would dangle from their heads. I can explain that later, but I won't have time. <laughs> they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi, which means great one or teacher, teacher. But you do not be called rabbi, <clears throat> for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on the earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, that means convert, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. This is Jesus. He's pretty awesome. <laughs> Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. And woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. By the way, camel is the largest unclean beast and they're just gobbling it down. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean, clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And woe to you, there's eight woes, hang in there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourself that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from the city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bechariah, Berechiah, excuse me, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And then I'm not going to cover in detail, but I'll read it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, a lot to cover, and I pray in the time remaining that you would bless our time. 
I pray that you'd prepare our hearts and our minds to receive all that you'd have for us, that we would be wiser, full of knowledge, but more importantly, wisdom. And Lord, that with this wisdom, with this knowledge, that we would honor you in and through our lives and the world in which you've placed us and the time in which you've called us to prepare it for generations to come, that we would be mindful of those behind because we want to be servants of the coming generation. And so, Lord, give us servants' hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. <clears throat> Hypocrisy. I'm not half the man. I, no, I'm not sure how it <laughs> Hypocrisy is uh, hypocritus, which is a Greek word that they used to use in the Greek theaters uh, where they would have these masks. And uh, you would come out, and back then you didn't have, uh, um, you know, our... Uh, all the CGI and all these other things, computer graphic images, you'd have to do your own props and, and you're going to be a comedian and you don't feel good that day. So you put on the smiley face, you want to be angry. So you put on a sad face and, and you still have the mouth open so they can hear you speaking in the amphitheater. And these were the masks they'd wear. And this was the idea of hypocrisy. It, it's a mask that doesn't match the inward man. It's an outward expression or I should say an outward uh, picture, but inside it's different uh, like a clown. Um, everybody loves a clown. Uh, just cool songs that are stuck in my head for times. But the, this is the picture that you have masks that you're wearing. And so here, here's another one. This is another way of hypocrisy. And you can kind of see that the masks they're wearing. And this is kind of how you're portraying yourself. You may have a smile on your face and you may be pretending like you really are sweet and thoughtful of the person you're speaking to, but actually inside you have an agenda and you're, you're playing them for a fool, and they're playing you for a fool, and you're trying to see who is the bigger fool, and you're shaking hands to enter into a deal, and you're waiting to take advantage of each other. And so this is the picture of hypocrisy. Now, in the text as we've been reading, hypocrisy is real simple. Hypocrisy complicates instead of simplifies. I'm going to say that again. Hypocrisy complicates instead of simplifies. Truth simplifies. Now, truth can be painful. It cuts right to the core. It hurts. But it's the truth. And we want to speak the truth in love. Jesus says that. Speak the truth in love. Truth without love is brutal. It's brutality. And love without truth is hypocrisy. Uh, I love you. You know, it's, it's kind of like, um, the best way I can describe it is, um, Truth without love is, is brutal. Uh, you know, I remember going to a cleaner, a dry cleaner across the street from the church uh, when I was in San Jose. It was a Chinese woman, real sweet. And I take my laundry over there and hadn't seen her in a few weeks. And I go to pick it up and she looks at me and she says, you have gained weight, you're fat. <laughs> and I, she's absolutely right. <laughs> and I would say to her, Susan, Thank you. I just want to share with you American culture. Um, that hurts a lot. You know, <laughs> we usually dance around it. Just, you never mind. But but she was right. But it still hurt. And there's ways to say it tenderly. You know, you need to work out a little bit. Looks like you know. I don't even know how to do it. You know, it's like. I, I, it's one of these things in, in America we practice. Um, and, and yet the man who is a drunk and beats his wife and, and she's going to leave him and has the bags packed. And he says, honey, I, I swear to God, I'll never beat you again. I love you. I love you. I'll never do it again. I love you. And next night he's drunk and he beats her. He may have a feeling towards her and feelings don't move. You know, one of the things Dennis Prager was talking about in his, his radio show is he'll put a, a question out there oftentimes and he'll say, how many of you didn't do drugs? And if you didn't, why? And he said, to the, to the person with the exception of maybe one out of hundreds, they said, I didn't do drugs because I feared my mother or I feared my father. None of them, none of them said, I didn't do drugs because I loved my mother or my father. You know, the reason why people do what they do is because they're just not loved enough. No, 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 you need to fear. 
You need to fear that. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this idea of not loved enough, I was listening to a, a, a panel, two guys on the outside, two ladies on the inside, and they were talking, they're young people that go out to campuses and they confront ideology and they battle, and the two gals in the center were saying, you know, we have broken people out there, and, and all of them were pro-life and they're contending for the abolition of abortion, and they're contending, and the two girls are saying, when we go on campus, we're contending, and the people we're speaking to are broken. And the other two guys on the outside are going, no, 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 they're the enemy, and it's ideology, and we're, I'm watching it going, oh, 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 and it's fascinating to me. And I thought to myself, would the Jew in the concentration camp, who's starving to death, go to the German guard and say, how did you get broken like this? What, what's wrong in your heart? Would the, would the slave on the plantation save to the slave owner? What, what is the brokenness in you? So in that sense, I'm like in full agreement with the guys on the outside. But on the other aspect, the Bible says that we're to love our enemies and do good to those who spitefully use us. So one of the pictures I had is on the micro level, we love. On the macro level, we contend for ideology. And, and to contend, you're dealing with con, 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 contradicting or contending ideologies. And it is a war for the mind. This, there's nothing sweet about what he said. Fools, hypocrites, brood of vipers, exclamation point. Read it for yourself, sweet Jesus. Hello? This is, this is a war of ideology and he's contending with Pharisees and scribes who run the government. And he lays out why they are wrong. And he is contending with them. So hypocrisy complicates, truth simplifies. God gave us 10 commandments. Has anyone seen the latest tax code? <laughs> I have a, a roll up and I've used it on a Wednesday night where I, I roll it out and it goes halfway down the aisle of all of the agencies in California that we pay for and have no voice in. And if I did the federal government, it would go out the door. No accountability. When, when, the, when, when the scribes and the Pharisees took a look just at the Sabbath alone, the day of rest, the day of rest, the day of rest, the Lord put it that way, day of rest. They added 40 volumes in the Talmud where it's like, I don't even want the Sabbath to come. It's exhausting. You, you get in an elevator in Israel on the Shabbat, the only elevator that's available is the Shabbat elevator. And you're like, oh, it's open. This is so great. You get in. Nobody's on the elevator. Bing, doors close on their own. Oh, first floor, boop, opens up. It closes. Second floor, boop. I'm on the 17th floor. Boom, boom, boom. They have a program that it opens and closes so that no one has to work on the Sabbath to press the button. Are you kidding me? In some homes, they used to... Cr train what they called Shabbat monkeys that would run around and turn the lights on for you. <laughs> 40 volumes of how you're supposed to enjoy the Sabbath, how you're to wash your hands. You have to follow the rules on that. And no more than a half uh, eggshell of water on each three times. What? <laughs> and 40 volumes and any time man takes it, what they're doing is they're making, they're making it impossible to find redemption. They're, they're, they're keeping you from the truth and from freedom. The, the ancients said that the law is the wise restraints that make men free. You restrain yourself towards evil in order to pursue excellence. <clears throat> we restrain from excellence in order to dumb down and stupefy or, or make, make less knowledgeable mankind in order to suppress them and to keep them from the truth. And so it, with this idea where you just add law after law after law and the burdens that come upon man, try running a business in California the regulations that are required when, when this idea that we're the most free nation on the face of the earth. And the idea is to suppress 
and, and, and there's, there's no redemption, it's a moving target. Let, let me give you an example. We're, we're, we're in a day and age now where, where sexuality is binary. Who are you today? Who, who do you feel like today? I love what Sam said in one of her statements. She said, you know what? I know how to deal with the whole race issue and the transgender issue and everything. Since we get to choose who we are on any given day, if you're offended that I'm white, I'm black. <laughs> Done. And if, you're, if I'm offended because you're black, then you're white, we're finished. Yes? yes. Everyone good with that? So when Ellen DeGeneres makes a statement to Katy Perry about her endowed chest area, if she's professing to be a lesbian, that's sexual harassment because it's the same thing that you place on anyone else. So, but do you see the moving target? And the moving target is so that no one has access and is able to obtain it. And with all the regulations and all the rules, we're just walking around going, I just hope I haven't broken one. I just hope I haven't broken one. I am going to lose my business. I'm going to lose everything. If I, I, I can't go there. I can't say that. I can't do that. And if you're off the reservation, you're, you, we take all of your assets. We wipe you out. They don't practice what they preach. All of our government officials give us regulations and healthcare and everything else that they're not bound by. They tell us we can't have a wall, but all of their houses have walls. I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the Pope, and this isn't a slap against Catholicism, it's a slap against the Pope, who would, who would decry our president, and all I think about the Vatican, take your wall down. Nobody's following me on that. Hypocrites, a hypocrite doesn't enter into the truth and shuts the doors for others to enter. Because for them to know the truth, the truth will set them free. I want them oppressed. And he is taking this and he is hammering it. This is Jesus. He's the one who is laying it down in such a profound way. And these are government officials. Don't get me wrong, they're government officials. Hypocrisy loves titles. People come in to say, Pastor Rob. I go, call me Rob. You have two choices. You can call me your gracious, forthright, magnanimous, illustrious potentate. <laughs> or you can call me Rob. <laughs> but I've oftentimes seen, you know, where you address someone and he said, well, it's doctor. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was thinking of uh, Brian Regan's deal when people are, you know, trying to up one with their stories and their titles. And, and there's like eight people on the face of the earth that can use this title. And it's the best one. You know, you're telling a story and you're going on me, 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 me. And I, and I flew in and, I, and then the person walks in and goes, I walked on the moon. <laughs> it's like, take the floor moonwalker. <laughs> you know, you can't beat that. I walked on the moon, but, but you get that title and, and, and you, you, you lord it over people because, ready? Because, ready? They're the experts. So shut up, do as you're told and like it. And if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you because I'm the expert. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not upset about anyone who's attained a doctorate. Praise the Lord, you're smart and apply that to wisdom and the world's a better place. But to use it to tell me I don't have a voice... Now I'll call you doctor if you've spent a lot of money and you've gone to medical school and you've got a drill in your hand and you're going to go on my tooth. <laughs> Good to see you this morning, doctor. <laughs> right? Hypocrites love great pretense. Flowing robes and baubles and trinkets and they take advantage of people as a result of that. Oftentimes I'm invited as a council member to go to the Reagan Library and, and I like to go and, and in my flesh, I kind of like what they do, but in my spirit, I'm kind of taken aback by it. I know why they do it, and I'm, I'm appreciative of it, but whenever I go to one of these events that I've been invited by the city, 
When I show up, they have my name and my wife's name, the Honorable Rob McCoy and Michelle McCoy. And the seats are in the front. Excuse me, pardon me, I'm the Honorable. <laughs> I don't know what happened between <laughs> when I woke up this morning but arriving here today, but apparently, I'm Honorable. <laughs> And everyone else going, oh, the honorable, oh, 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 All of you know me. That's why you're thinking, wait. And I like sitting in the front. It's a good seat. Thank you so much. I didn't ask for it. They gave it to me. <laughs> but there's a part of me sitting there going, if anyone in this room knew who you really were, they would take that sign off in a heartbeat. You might just want to go to the back of the room. I, one of the things I was noticing at the CNP, the Council for National Policy, Michelle and I arrived there, and it's, it's a book of who's who. All oh, the great who's who. Me? I'm in the book of who's he. <laughs> and these are folks that have a lot of money. And I'm watching folks work them for the money, and they've got the mask on. How are you? And, da, 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 and they're all working their deal. And that's, that makes sense because they have ministries and got to be funded and they know they're there for that reason and everyone's in agreement and that's what they're doing. And Michelle and I, I, I remember I was with one person who's a friend and then another person comes up and the friend has money and this person comes up and invites them to come to an event and I'm standing right there and I've known them too. And they know me so well they know I have no money. And I wasn't invited. And, and as we're walking back, he didn't invite you. I go, I don't have any money. So you know why he invited you. He wants my money. I said, way to go, Einstein. <laughs> Figured that out. And, and, and what I enjoyed is, you know, it came time for dinner. Oh, where are we seated? And I'm with some folks that are in the gold circle and they pay 30,000 a year to get there. And two other folks are in the gold circle. One's a president of the whole thing. And they said, where are you seated? Are you with us? And I look on and they're in table three and table four right in the center. Oh, I'm table 27. So that's, <laughs> is that in the room? I, so, so. And we had so much fun at our table. And the scripture says, sit in the back. And if they want to call you forward, they call you forward. And I didn't know anybody in there. I, was, I had no desire to drum up money because of what we're doing, you know. And so as, as we're going through this, this is that idea of wanting a premier seat that Jesus is speaking of. And unbeknownst to us, somebody came up and they're apparently very wealthy and they said, we've been waiting for you to come to our town, da 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 and, Oh, really? So-and-so told us about you? Oh, really? I didn't know them. I didn't go seek them. They came to me. And they wanted us to come and do these things. And I said, okay, that's great. My point is this, Jesus says to them, look at these Pharisees that sit in Moses' seat. They're rightly dividing the word of truth. They're teaching the scriptures, but they're not holding to the word. So do what they say, but don't do what they do. Do what they say, but don't do what they do. God's word is true regardless of who's teaching it. I was led to the Lord and discipled by a man who, com who committed adultery against his wife and fornication with my fiance and got her pregnant. That's the man that led me to the Lord and discipled me. And it wasn't Michelle. It was my, I was engaged. And my fiance was pregnant. And I didn't know that she was pregnant by him. I thought it was me. That's crazy. Some of you who are new are going to leave now. <laughs> or some of you are going... He's like me. <laughs> now, he was an unbelievable teacher. And I learned everything I know about Christianity from his work. God didn't let me down. He did. And in all honesty, he didn't even let me down. I did. I got in that mess. I was just as responsible for the mess. And, and when I went to tell my dad, my mom, my girlfriend's pregnant, we're getting married, and they flipped out, they weren't Christians, and I said, I, I, we're, you know, we're going to give birth to the baby. My dad said, dad, get an abortion. I said, dad, I can't do that. It's against what I believe in. He said, look where your beliefs have gotten you so far. And my response to my dad was, dad, I did that. God didn't. And I'm not going to follow it up with another mistake. I'm not going to kill this baby. My dad said, you, you, you give birth to that baby. And my mom said it too. You will never step foot in this house. You're, you'll be out. And I said, I love you and I'll miss you. And I walked out. 
And that's what led them both to the Lord. Because my mother had confessed to having had two abortions and it was a total transformation. She came to this place and it was conviction and her life changed. And I'm grateful for that. But it was a lonely year. Lonely. But God didn't let me down. So the word is always true regardless of who the teacher is. Bob Coy in Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, blew it. He just screwed it up so bad. But every, his lessons I still refer to because they're good teachings. That, that's a hypocrite. Their personal life is just troubled, but the word, the Bible says the word of God does not return void. It's living, it's breathing, it's sharper to any, to any two-edged sword, able to divide the thoughts and intents of the heart. Right? And so here he's saying they sit in these seats and they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear. They lay them on men's shoulders. And, and as they go through this, the idea is I'm going to take the truth and, and I'm going to add to it burdens that are cumbersome upon you so as to control you and to keep you from the truth. If they're teaching the truth, stay to that. But if they start going to different teachings like the Talmud and on and on and on, now you've got problems. And they're going to appear with these phylacteries and their borders of their garments and these places in the feast and the seats in the synagogue. They're going to appear special and everyone's going to call them rabbi and teacher and doctor and, you know, the, and they're going to do all these things. But there's only one, the Christ, and the Lord makes emphasis. And let me say this to you. All of you rise and fall before one master, and that's the Lord. I'm not your master. If I'm if this is heavy shepherding and I'm telling you what you're supposed to wear and who you're supposed to date and you can't marry that person unless you come and check with the leadership first and we've got to go through the, and then we have to, and then boom, and then go find another church immediately, immediately. We have one master, it's the Lord. He's the teacher. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be a servant of all, Jesus says. You, 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 you whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Just serve people. Don't worry about titles. Don't worry about trying to work your way in there. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. You're keeping people out of the kingdom for the sake of your own personal gain. That's a hypocrite. Listen, folks. As Christians, you believe this and, and seek to honor that and attain that and walk there, and you've failed for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're not righteous because of the law. We're not made righteous by the law. We're made righteous because of what Christ did. We don't observe the law to be saved. We observe the law because we are saved. And we fail to do that, but his grace is sufficient. And we set the standard for our own lives. We don't set the standard so that if you obtain this standard, you'll have redemption. Redemption is really simple. If you're a sinner who has failed to obtain the law, you've been separated from the love, from, you've been separated from God because sin separates us. Big chasm like this one right here. And let's say God's here and you're here. How do you span that chasm? It's the cross of Christ. He paid the penalty. This is important. The wages of sin is death. Blood must be shed for the remission of sin. Christ died, paid the penalty for your sin. Now you can cross over and be re relungari, which is religion, relinked to the Father. That's simple. Now, if I say, well, you can't quite cross that chasm unless you don't drink, smoke, or chew, or hang around with those who do, and you got to have a Shabbat monkey and a <laughs> three, and then, the, and then, and well, you're like, uh, who can get there? It's a moving target. And the minute, I have news for you, the minute you walk across that chasm and you have that relationship with the Lord, you now know freedom and you begin to declare it. Amen. And you're fearless. And all of a sudden, mankind is changed when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve their, whoa. And you declare this freedom to the world. And this is what he's pointing out, that they shut heaven from others and they don't allow them to enter in. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for the pretense make long prayers, therefore you receive greater condemnation. There's no bigger stick to hit someone over the head with than God, especially if you want to get money out of them. And the pretense, how they can take one word, God, and give 11 syllables to it. Yeah. 
praise God. <laughs> oh. And you owe the Lord everything. Ma. Long prayers. And they go so long, you're like, just stop. I'll give money already. <laughs> and when we sit down and we eat, everyone says, Pastor, would you like to pray? Well, thank you very much, because apparently everyone else here is unqualified. <laughs> so let me pray. This is my prayer every time. Lord, thank you for the food. Amen. <laughs> I didn't even have time to bow my head. <laughs> Sometimes I'll say, Lord... Uh, thank you for the food, but more importantly, thank you for the company. Because I really enjoy being with the, with the Lord and being with the people I'm with. A little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do your devotion, do your devotion at home. The food's getting cold. <laughs> Is Jim Mather here? <laughs> I say that to Jim all the time. <laughs> he still didn't like it. <laughs> no, he's sweet. Verse 16, woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple, uh, no, I'm sorry, v verse 15, woe to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you travel land and sea to win one prostitute. When he's one, you make him twice as much as son of hell as yourself. And, and you're, you're duplicating yourself, you're not duplicating the Lord. You're, you're, you've got your own pet peeve, you've got people dialed in on it. He goes further with this, verse 16, swears by the temple. You, you, you say, I, I, I don't swear by the temple, I swear by the gold in it. That's where Christianity is today. It's Christian industry. It's not Christian ministry. And we, we say we love the Lord, we say, but we don't trust him. And, and we don't swear by the God who sanctifies. We, we swear by the money. 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 What? <laughs> hmm. Sorry. <laughs> when Titus Vespasian in 70 AD destroyed the temple and he burned it down, there was over $10 million in silver in there. These Pharisees and scribes had milked everybody and they were rolling in money. And you know, it's been said, uh, the, the joke that the Pope said, uh, you know, looking at the treasury in the Vatican, um, and, and it, it could be for any Protestant denomination, but don't, don't be upset if you're Catholic, it's just a joke. But the, the Pope, not the one now, but another one that you didn't like, said, <laughs> said, we can no longer say, as he's looking at the treasury, we can no longer say silver and gold have I none. At which point the treasurer said, yes, and neither can we say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You're no different than the world. You got all the money and you played it the same way the world has, but you, you're more concerned with the gold. And how does that happen? The bigger the church, the the more concerned you are with your budgets, buildings, and baptisms. 16 years I've been the pastor. I don't have it right, but I'll tell you one thing I have not wanted to do in 16 years or 17 years now, and everybody's been upset about it. Not everybody, but a lot of folks. And no longer, but it was, we contended. I've never wanted to own property because it makes the board concerned about the building. We're conduits, not reservoirs. We live week to week, and this is how it is. I want us to live by faith. If God can get it through us, he'll get it to us. And, and you never see an offering bag being passed. The this, this scripture points out, we don't, we don't pass an offering bag, and I want to point this out. Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold in the temple, he goes through that whole picture. And then he says, verse 23, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay the tithe of mint and anise and coming and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You see, money becomes the main theme of the church. And I have news for you. The New Testament, and, and I've got people going, don't, don't, don't go there. Well, I'm going to go there. The New Testament. <laughs> The New, <laughs> the New Testament does not command <clears throat> tithing. The New Testament doesn't command tithing. You can't find it. And it's hurt, it hurts. <laughs> it doesn't command tithing. The way that you come up in, in, in the church with a practice or a doctrine is three things. This is how the church establishes practice and doctrine. 
The first one is, 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 is it found in the life and the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, the four Gospels? The second is, is it practiced in the book of Acts? And the third is, is it expounded upon in the epistles? You never see Jesus tithing. You never see it in the book of Acts. Now they give, but they don't tithe. It's not commanded, it's not required. We're saved by grace, not by, by works. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, and it's not expounded in the epistles. It talks about a love offering, but you're not commanded. Now the scriptures do declare that when you give the first fruits, there's a blessing and all that is true. That if you put God first in your life and the idea of the tithe is a 10th of your income, and it's a good place to start. People say, we're not under the law. No, we're under grace and grace is greater than law. So go bigger than a tithe. But here's, here's the thing. We, we will preach tithing. It'll be the number one message for a church if they're not teaching expositionally because what's the first thing that is important to a church is the budgets, the buildings, and the baptisms. And so every week we're gonna be talking about tithing and we're gonna have the thermometer and we're gonna have the building fund and we're gonna be, you know, and pledge gift and da, da, da. And I have to tell you something. The only time I ever talk on tithing is if the text talks on tithing like right now. And I'm pointing out that the New Testament doesn't command tithing. And I never talk about money because of a lack of it or a, a, an abundance of it. The health of a church is not the size of its budget. I learned that a long time ago. It's not the, it's not the amount that's being given. The health of a church is the number of congregants giving. Because that means you're giving. And I'm not commanding it. This is a, an act of your heart to the Lord that I want you first. And this is, I, I got to share with you something about, that's special about this church. On a good Sunday, maybe 500 people. And I am working hard to preach that down to a more manageable size. <laughs> On a good Sunday, maybe 500 people. We average 62 checks a week in addition to online giving. So that's about 70 offerings. 70 times four, was that 280? Yes? So 280 times two, because you have a husband and a wife, 560. Do you realize that pretty much every person in this church gives? Do you know, do you know how rare that is? Do you know how proud I am to be the pastor of this fellowship? I've never told you to do that. You do it on your own free accord. There's no guilt or condemnation. That is so profound. I tell other pastors that they, they can't believe it. I'm moved by that. I wanted to tell you thank you. I'm out of time. I picked up way too much of a text. I can finish. Will you give me four minutes? Yes. Five. Five. Yes. <laughs> Givers! <laughs> Givers! Look at verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of extortion, self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside of them may be clean also. You're purporting yourself to be this, but in, in private, you're not. And you put those burdens on. You know why people are legalistic? Because they want to keep you at an arm's distance so you don't examine their own life. And the ones who are demanding rules on you are usually not obeying them in their own life. Not always true, but 99.99, it's like dove soap. <laughs> and this is one of my favorites, this idea of the cup. Cleanse first the inside of the cup so that the outside is also maybe clean. I mean, this is a perfect example. You go into a restaurant, you get a glass of water, you're like, eh, and you're drinking it down. You just see this loogie at the bottom and you're like, oh God, please. Let that be on the outside of the cup. <laughs> And you get that thing down and you're like, oh, it's on the inside. <laughs> and the Lord is saying, look, clean up your side of the street. You know what we need? We need pastors who are more on fire for the Lord. We need, no, what we need is you calming down and taking care of your own life and praying for me. It's another glass. You look, you see the specs. I, I don't know. I wouldn't drink it. That's just all I'm saying. <laughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. 
which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. It doesn't matter if you have an Armani suit on, you're still dead inside. Whitewashed tombs, if you stepped on a tomb, you'd be unclean for, so if you're coming to the Passover, you've traveled to Jerusalem, you want, you're so excited, you've traveled all the way from Rome, and you walk through and you step on a tombstone, you're unclean and you can't participate in the Sabbath. So what they would do as a kind of a courtesy is they would paint them all white so everyone could see them. You're like, okay, okay, everyone walk over. And this is what they would do. And the Lord coming up to the Sabbath, coming up to, excuse me, coming up to the Passover, he's in, with all the scribes and Pharisees, he's going to be He's going to be killed soon. This, we're approaching that. They're up in Jerusalem. Everyone's coming in, and he points to the whitewashed tombs. He says, that's you. You're beautiful on the outside, but you are dead man's bones on the inside. You're full of lawlessness and hypocrisy. He is laying it on thick, and there's no way to get around it. We're and then he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build tombs of the prophets and adorn them with monuments, righteousness. If we lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have killed them. It's amazing to me how every great leader in the history of the world was reviled. And then all of a sudden, they have this conviction. Martin Luther King Jr., the church reviled him. Everyone reviled him. He rises to a place of significance, and everybody wants to put their movement attached to him. Reagan. You just go back and not, nobody wanted to be affiliated with Reagan. And now everybody wants to be affiliated with Reagan. I remember. I, I remember this. William Wilberforce was the laughing stock. Winston Churchill was the laughing stock. And now they're revered. I had nothing to do with that. We're, we're all just sheep. Ah! Somebody breaks out and says, freedom. Go, <laughs> There's your history lesson right there. I'll close with this since I have two minutes. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophet, stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I will just close with this idea. The Lord looked at these civic leaders and said, your nation is gonna be destroyed. And it won't come back on the face of the earth until 1948. And it's judgment. And the reason why is because you have moved away from me and you will be in the ash heap of history of those who have walked away from God. Righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. And, and by 70 AD, their temple would be destroyed and there would be a remnant up on, on uh, Masada and they'd be killed by the Romans and that would be the last piece of real estate the Jews would own until 1948. And they'd have to lose 6 million people in the Holocaust in order for the world to feel sorry and say, let's give them a place to go. Because we can't keep them in the concentration camps. That's where, that's where they were putting the Jews, back in the concentration camps. After they'd been delivered and they'd been released, they didn't have any place for them to go, and nobody wanted Jews in their hometown, so they put them back in the concentration camps. True story. And they said, what do we do? Well, let's just put them in Palestine. And everyone's like, I guess that's, nobody wants it. It's just marshland anyways. Moved them back. And, and the idea is God is saying, I wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. And one of my favorite stories of all times, illustration, the farmer's barn burns down. And he goes out to assess the damage. He's heartbroken. His livestock's dead. And one of the things that just breaks his heart is year after year, he'd won the blue ribbon at the state fair with this prize hen. And he walks up and he sees this hen and the carcass is burned. It's feathers are out and it's just cooked and he's so frustrated at the loss and he's angry and he just kicks the carcass and out from the carcass runs the little chicks that were saved in the fire as a mother hen gathers her chicks the lord took the beating so we could be set free you hate hypocrisy you hate it first place to hate it is in your own life God has given you access to freedom. And he says, come to me, all you are burdened and heavy laden with all the rules and the regulations. Come to me, all you are burdened and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I've come to set the captives free. 
and it begins with you. The chasm is crossed with the blood of Christ and you have a relationship with the living God who covers you with his wings. And the end of hypocrisy begins with yourself because now you have access to truth and now you can lead others to it. And hypocrisy can end right now, individually. You receive the truth and you go to set others free. Or you can come up with your weird concept of life and move the target. And you, you and I both know it is so confusing and depressing. And God has given you life and life more abundant today. The Bible says if you believe in your heart, confess with your tongue Jesus is Lord, you will be saved to the glory of the Father. That's that simple. Hypocrisy wants to complicate it. Truth simplifies it. It's that simple. And the Lord made it very clear. I was going to go into a whole thing, but I'm not because the Lord won't give me a piece about it. And we're out of time. Let's pray. Man, the Lord's good. Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you that you made it so clear of what hypocrisy is and that you've come to set us free from the hypocrisy that complicates to the truth that simplifies and today we have come to realize that there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved but that of Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, the life. And no man crosses that chasm, comes to the Father, but by you, Lord. And so with that understanding, we want to thank you today that we can end hypocrisy in our own life and prepare to end it in the world as we know the truth and open the doors for others to come to know it. So God, thank you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll stand and we'll close with a song of praise and worship. And I just want you to go home and realize hypocrisy ends the day. And if you're sick of hypocrisy in the church, well, we're sick of you too. God bless you guys.